The Chosen One prophecy dates back to around the time of the First Great Schism, um, about 25,000 BBY. It's actually called a Prophecy of Mortis, um, so the prophecy originally came from Mortis um, sometime before 25,000 BBY. Jedi Path talks about how the line about destroying the Sith was actually added later. And being from Mortis, and of course what we see in the Mortis arc in Clone Wars Season 3, originally the prophecy just spoke about um, some, a saviour who would replace the father, um, not a saviour who would destroy the Sith. Um, that was added later on. Get into one of the more important story points here now, and that is Anakin's conception. Um, to understand Anakin's power level, you need to understand his conception and what his conception means. Um, people often, I don't think, know what being the Chosen One means. They say the Chosen One like it's it's just the name of a prophet, right? But it's not just the name of some prophet, um, the foretold name of some prophet. It actually carries a lot more weight to it than that. Now, one of the most fun things about doing this, right, is the little connections that the authors put into the material. The relaunched Star Wars Fact File 23 notes that the Chosen One is an entity that would be born of a concentration of both energies, light and dark. And it also talks about how Anakin himself represented the balance between the light and dark sides of the Force. So it's like if you have red and blue mixed together and they make purple. You know, you've got dark and light, they clash together, you get balance as the result. Relaunch Fact File 23 also talks about the Valley of the Jedi and how that was created. And talks about how it was pretty much created the exact same way as Anakin. You know, you have the Army of Light, and you've got the Brotherhood of Darkness, and you've got the, the Sith spirits, you've got the Dark Side, and you've got the Light Side, the, the Light Side, the Jedi spirits. And they clash together, and then you get this powerful balance, and that's the balance power that Jerek draws off in Dark Forces. Mentions together, they formed the balance and the force that resulted in the powerful Light Side Center. The combination of Jedi and Sith's souls made a potent mix, yet together they formed the Nexus and the force that resulted in the powerful Light Side Center. That's repeated in both Relaunch Fact File 23 and the original Fact File 129. Dark Forces talks about the Valley of the Jedi and says, but the balance created between light and dark is immensely volatile, and only a fool or madman would try to tap into it. And again, um, if you haven't seen or played Dark Forces um, or read the books, um, essentially Jerick's on the cusp of infinite power. Um, you can see here. So essentially both Anakin's power and the Valley of the Jedi's power are created through the exact same method. We've got two massive wells of light and dark side energies clashing together to create a balance. One of them manifested in Anakin Skywalker's force presence, the other manifested in the Valley of the Jedi. But which quantity the power is greater? Is it the Valley of the Jedi or is it Anakin Skywalker and why? When you look at the creation of the Valley of the Jedi, um, it's a couple of thousand Sith spirits and a couple of thousand Jedi spirits. Um, and they crash together and create that balance power. So it's important to note the strength Jerich wields here. Dark Forces 2 Rebel Agent talks about how it could be catastrophic. It says, imagine someone who could destroy a star with a whisper, eradicate a solar system with a snap of his fingers, or think a planet from orbit. It also says it gives him power so vast, unthinkable power, power so vast, so terrible, that it could extinguish a sun, plunge an entire solar system into darkness, and condemn billions to death. It also says Jerich gained absolute omniscience from this. So the will of the Force, the chaos, ancient civilizations, the Rakata, um, the, origin, the origins of the universe, basically. Um, it also says that the valley can make him invincible, and um, the valley has limitless power. A repository of unthinkable power. And that's just the balance created between the energies of the Army of Light and the Brotherhood of Darkness. Um, so that's only a few thousand Jedi spirits and a few thousand Sith spirits that make a balance that strong. But when it comes to Anakin's power, right, in Anakin's case with this, um, the components are every single Jedi, every single Sith, every single living thing, every single the entire Force that... Um, basically results in his creation. So it's the Valley of the Jedi, same thing happening there, but on a much, much larger scale. Since we have Plagueis reaching out to every single midichlorian in existence, um, which results in Anakin's creation. So you're talking, you're talking about, I don't know how many times, millions of times um, more, it's on a million times bigger scale, basically, um, Anakin's creation than, than the Valley of the Jedi is. Um, so if you just look at the sheer power Jerich is wield, wielding there and can wield there, um, and then compare that to what Anakin's power must be, um, that speaks for itself really. And that, it's that very detail where the whole um, purpose of the Chosen One um, comes in and you can start to see what being the Chosen One actually means. Because if Plagueis reached out to every single midichlorian in existence, it was the entire force um, that basically created Anakin as the balance. Um, so basically what Plagueis is doing there is he's reaching out to every single midichlorian from every single living thing. Starships and Vehicles talks about this, uh, Plagueis Novel talks about this, and um, so basically what he's doing there is he's reaching out to all of those cells and he's causing cell divisions. Drunk on newfound power then, he had attempted an even more unthinkable act, to bring into being a creation of his own. Not merely the impregnation of some hapless, mindless creature, but the birth of a forceful being. The ability to dominate death had been a step in the right direction, 
but it wasn't equivalent to pure creation. And so he had stretched out, indeed, as if invisible, transubstantiated, to inform every being of his existence and impact all of them. Munoid or insectoid, secure or dispossessed, free or enslaved, a warrior waving a banner in triumph on a battlefield, a ghost infiltrating a dream. And um, the draft cut for the Revenge of the Sith script actually gives us a little information on what cell splitting actually does. And so what cell splitting actually does is it actually creates living force energy. And so of course the cell splitting from every single midichlorian uh, that creates living force energy and that's the energy that is manifested in Anakin Skywalker. So Sidious says the cell divisions is what created Anakin. Um, George Lucas says in archives that cells split to create life. Um, he also says that the personal force is the energy field created by ourselves interacting and doing things, aka, you know, split and doing all different things. Um, he also says um, midichlorians are like mitochondria that basically create the chemical energy that turns one cell into two cells. So, you know, he's reaching out to all them cells, um, creating all them cell divisions. Um, them cell divisions create a lot of energy, load of energy, light and dark, which obviously the concentration of that creates a balanced power, which is Anakin. So you've essentially got every single midichlorian, good ones and bad ones, duplicating, creating that light and dark energy, the concentration of which turns into balance power in reaction to Plagueis' experiments. Because of course what happens is the Force actually rejects Plagueis, um, or the cells in the room start to mutate, or the midichlorians start to mutate, and the Force runs away and basically says, nah, fuck this, after Plagueis starts to reach out to all life and, you know, attempt to create a godlike being, um, the Force essentially says, nah. So Anakin was um, basically the Force's counter to Plagueis' dark presence and all his mad experiments that he was doing. The force grew silent, as if in flight from him, and many of the animals in his laboratory succumbed to horrifying diseases. He had to know if the force had struck back again, nine years earlier, by conceiving a human being to restore balance to the galaxy. The article Barely Tolerable Alien Henchman of the Empire Part 3 gives us a little bit of insight into Anakin's conception. It tells us what Plagueis actually did was create a zygote, because a zygote is already a fully formed being. It's already fertilized, it just needs to grow in the mother, which means Anakin's not even related to Shmi. He's just a being of pure force. Every single cell in his body is a vessel for the force, which indeed he is called in many sources, like the Jedi Path and Tenebrous Way. All Shmi actually does is exactly what she says in the episode. I carried him, I gave birth, I raised him. I can't explain what happened. And essentially she had no part in the creation of Anakin whatsoever, he's a being of pure force. Let's go to the Clone Wars for a second and look at how that compares to the Wands. The Wands are embodiments of all that energy, right? All the energy the universe throws through Mortis, flows through Mortis, and then the Wands personify that power on Mortis. Um, so picture all the energy in the galaxy, right? There's like um, a tapestry um, of strings, you know, all connected. Like, um, picture the stars in the sky, and if you connect them with um, strings, that's all what the Force would look like. You, know, you can get insight from this in the Heart of the Jedi novel where Luke can actually see the force visually and it actually says uh, it was a grid work of uncountable fine threads running here, there and to various points connecting, linking, crossing, intertwining in a complex woven fabric that seemed to bind all into a whole tapestry and many threads shot away from it into the surrounding space as if stretching out to other worlds it's the lines of energy, said Luke, I can see it Another good one from Heart of the Jedi says, It's strong with the Force, the threads of energy which interweave to bind all life together have many crossings here. It's a collection point, it's concentrated power, form a sort of gateway into the pure essence of all being. And the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. And it's a shared power, right? We're all connected, it's those threads that go between each person, each living being. It's those threads that we draw on, it's those that we get our power from, and how powerful someone is, is dependent entirely on, um, you know, their force presence, their presence in the force. How many crossings of threads is that? How many crossings of those threads is their force presence? Same obviously goes for like a nexus as well. Um, of course, like the heart of the Jedi is where loads of those light side threads cross. Um, so when I say Mortis is where all the life, all the force energy of the galaxy flows, what that basically means is Mortis is a point where every single one of those threads cross. And when I say Anakin is connected to everything, um, that's also what I mean. Anakin is also a place where all of those threads cross. And if you look, it's the same thing happening there on Mortis as it is um, with the creation of the balance at the Clash. Um, remember that I mentioned, you know, you've got red and blue, they mix to make purple, you've got light and dark, they mix to make balance. That's exactly what's happening on Mortis. You've got the son, the daughter and the father, you've got the daughter and the son's power running through the father. Um, all their power runs through each other. It creates one big symbiotic circle. You and I are tied together, and your strength runs through me. This way, I take your power. And for the father, um, of course, um, through Mortis runs the entire force. Um, same 
as the creation with Anakin. Um, so the father and Anakin are almost exactly alike, and that's why Anakin is, of course, chosen to take the father's place. And um, they're both connected to everything, um, both sides of the Force, the entire Force. They're both connected to it. And that's fundamentally inherent in the nature as the chosen one and as the father. Which is why they're both constantly touted with being the very embodiment of the Force. Um, Relaunch Fact File um, talks about this. Um, Starships and Vehicle Collection talks about this. Talks about how the result of Plagueis' experiments would be the very embodiment of the Force. And then it talks about how Anakin is the result of Plagueis' experiments. And um, power isn't just about who done what and like all these different comparisons you make. Like, Star Wars The Force is a mystical binding energy field. You know, that's what it is in a Lucas context. Take away like, all them video games that make it the Force a superpower. What makes one powerful is the amount of connections they have in the Force. The amount of the things they're connected to and how closely they're connected to it. So Anakin and the father, right, they're connected to everything, and that's why he's the chosen one. He's chosen to save the galaxy, because he's the only one who can, because he's the only one who has all those connections to be able to affect everything. He's connected to everything, so he affects everything. His decisions shape the galaxy, which is why we get quotes like, Hayden Christensen plays the conflicted young Jedi Anakin Skywalker, upon whose decisions rest the fate of the galaxy. Um, you get Yoda in the Yoda Code, Hidden Yoda Code in Clone Wars comic magazine 7, which says, terrifies me this possibility does, if Anakin were ever to fall to the dark side, the prospects for the galaxy dire would they be? Um, and then you get stuff like in the Anakin Skywalker G-Canon data bank that says, Anakin has left an undeniable mark on the history of the galaxy, leading it through periods of lightness and dark. Which of course has to be in a force context, because Anakin never held any sort of galactic political power to lead the galaxy through anything. But we do know that the galaxy does follow in suit with Anakin's internal struggle. So in a Force context, he's leading the galaxy through whatever sort of emotional turmoil he's going through within himself. Which is seen in like the slideshow collectible Star Wars figures and um, relaunch Fact File 23 that both talk about how Anakin's choice governs the storm, um, governs the coming storm, how his internal imbalance affects the galaxy. It's like it said in Revenge of the Sith, he holds the Force in a white hot fist, it's his to control, to wield, to mould, and it's only the Jedi that are hoping that he's going to do it for the good. Which ties in of course to why Sidious wants Anakin in the first place. Um, obviously he's connected to everything, so if Sidious can corrupt the Chosen One, like he talks about in um, Dark Lord Rise of Darth Vader, if he can corrupt the Chosen One, all this, then if he can corrupt the Chosen One, he can corrupt the entire Force through that. And that of course is why we get things in the Clone Wars, um, like... What do you want with Anakin Skywalker? He is the key to everything. To bring balance to the Force? To destroy. The Chosen One is the key. He who controls Skywalker will control everything. As I've been saying, there's a lot deeper mechanics to everything than just saying, like, oh, Sidious wants Anakin because he's a strong Jedi. You know what I mean? There's mechanics, deep elements behind everything. Which brings me back to the Mortis feat, which I see a lot of misunderstanding around on the internet. In fact, I don't think I've seen a single person get this Mortis feat right, okay? One of the only things I actually see talked about when it comes to this Mortis feat is, oh, Anakin's full potential, Anakin tapped into his full potential and tamed the ones, and this was like a, a glimpse of what he could have been. And I'll get to that in a sec, because that is one massive misconception. But what is really happening there is that Anakin can tame both the son and daughter because he's connected to everything. Like the father, he's got both sides running through him. So he, the son and the daughter are both 50% of Anakin's power, just as they're both 50% of the father's power. And that's why it's only the father and Anakin who contain the ones, is because it's only the father and Anakin who are embodiments of the Force. And that there, my friends, is what being the Chosen One means. It means being the embodiment of the Force, having both sides of the Force run through you. You're the balance in the Force, right? That's what being the Chosen One is. So all he needs to do is tap into that power and control it. Each the son and daughter are both 50% of Anakin's power. Or, in other terms, the father and Anakin are both twice as powerful as the son and daughter. And I don't want to hear, like, Ooh, if Anakin was so much more powerful than the father, if he was as powerful as the father, why is he not uh, doing all this? And why is he not draining planets and throwing all this shit around? Because the Force isn't doesn't exist like that. Lucas isn't going to write the Force like that. Like, he has Anakin as the embodiment of the Force, and he doesn't have him throwing around planets and jumping over, like, mountains and shit, you know what I mean? Lucas doesn't even have the father like that. In fact, the father, the embodiment of either side of the Force, which is pretty much as powerful as you could possibly get in a Lucas context, in, in the universe, because you are the Force. Um, it's, it's the Ones, and they're not, they're not throwing planets around, draining all sorts of 
shit and jumping around and all that. You know, this relatively grounded, like the film medium. You know, it's that same universe. That's how the Force, that's the limits of the Force in a Lucas context. Like, in order to understand this fully and, like, for it to all make sense, you have to not look at this like a normal sort of, like, versus thing. Like, you, like you'd look at, like, a wiki scaling or, like, anime versus. You can't look at it like that. You have to look at it from a cosmological, myth mythological standpoint. Because, again, a lot of what manifests in power is stuff that runs deep. Um, not stuff that's immediately apparent, like a, just some, some move with telekinesis or something. It's stuff that runs deep and has significance on, like, a spiritual level. Um, and in terms of, like, peace of mind and one with the force sort of thing. That's where power manifests in the Lucas medium, at least more so than, like, force powers. That's just a sort of side thing that you can do with your power. Back to the Mortis feast anyway, basically Anakin displays power in Season 3 that is at least on par with the Father. Which is all a demonstration that Anakin is in fact the Chosen One, does in fact have the Son and Daughter's power running through him, is in fact the embodiment of the Force and can do this. I'll note here as well that Anakin's full potential is not mentioned in a single place when talking about the Mortis feet, right? It's not mentioned once. Yeah, I see so many people online saying, Oh, um, the Mortis feet was just because Anakin tapped into his full potential. For one, that's stupid, right? Because the issue is Anakin needs to do this now, right? This is a now problem. It's not an Anakin in 40 years after he's mastered everything problem. Anakin needs to go and do this now. This is when the dark side is. This is the greatest despair that Anakin was born for. This is his moment, right? It's not Anakin could be that strong in 40 years with all this mastery. It's Anakin is that strong now. Anakin's so powerful that he can do this. Every single quote on the matter attributes it to his power level. Not one mention of potential. You get stuff from the online StarWars.com encyclopedia, you get stuff from the episode guide, um, from the episode galleries that all just said, you know, it was, dis it was a display of Anakin's raw power, it was a display of his power, he was powerful enough to do it, he had the power. Nothing mentions potential. And you got one straight up there from Relaunch Fact File 59 that says Anakin was powerful enough to maintain balance between dark and light. And you got one there, and it seems he was the only one strong enough. You know, it's not about potential, it's about his power now, which makes pain you know, when you actually think about it. I mean, the issue is now. This is the greatest despair. We need the chosen one now. And it's all attributed to the power within Anakin, right? They always say that the force within, within him is stronger than anyone else. You were right. The force within him is stronger than any known Jedi. I've trained him as well as I could. The power within Anakin, which of course is the same, the power within him is his internal imbalance, which is the power that shapes the galaxy. So I know what people are thinking, like, oh yeah, well, if Anakin was power powerful enough, then why did he why did he have to use the Mortis Nexus? Well, if you pay close attention there, um, Anakin doesn't actually need to use the Mortis Nexus at all. In fact, the father doesn't even tell him to, he doesn't even bring it up. It's Kenobi that tells Anakin to use the Mortis Nexus. Their powers are too strong for us, Anakin! Save Ahsoka! The planet is the Force. Use it. All the father says is literally, You must now release the guilt and free yourself by choosing. But then Pablo Hidalgo reveals in Clone Wars Secrets Revealed in 3D that Anakin actually did defy the father in using the Nexus. Because the whole thing, right, is he needs to... Um, he needs to choose one. He needs to free himself by choosing, because he can free himself because by choosing one, he has to let go of the other. And of course, letting go is the big thing in Star Wars. That's how you become one with the Force. Just let it go. Let go. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. So what the Father wanted Anakin to do there was essentially let go, become one with the Force, and free that inner power. Let that inner power from within himself out. But Anakin defies that and instead draws it from without himself. So he's drawing from all that energy that's so easily flowing on, on Mortis. Because it's all the energy in the galaxy, right? All that energy in the galaxy is flowing through this tiny space on Mortis. All that energy is so abundant, so free to use, which is what Pablo Hidalgo explains in Secret, Re Secret Revealed in 3D. Anakin shows the easy option here, um, but it wasn't necessarily the right option. It's still still proved he was capable of wielding that power, so he still passed the test. The father was still able to tell he was the chosen one because he was capable of wielding that same power, but he pulled it from without himself instead of from within himself. Also note here as well that the father actually says that he needs to be on the Nexus to tame the ones, to keep them in control. It is only here that I can control them. A family in balance. Which makes it even more impressive, the, the fact that he doesn't even mention that to Anakin, and the fact that Anakin doesn't actually need to be on the Nexus to tame the ones. Um, of course, that's to do with the, the father's nature. You know, he is a personification of the power on Mortis. The shapes we embody are merely a reflection of the life force around us. So, of course, he needs the Mortis Nexus. But the takeaway here that I think a lot of people miss is that Anakin is fundamentally equal to the father, at least, in Season 3. 
In fact, one of the first things the father says to Anakin is um, that basically you're not like any other Jedi or Sith. You're like us. You're you're an entity like us, basically. I am neither Sith nor Jedi. I am much more. And so are you. But the whole weight behind the mortis feet is you have to be the chosen one. You have to have both sides of the force running through. You have to be the embodiment of the force. You have to be bound. You have to be created by the entire force. You have to have that conception. So the chosen one isn't really just a title you can throw around to anyone who's like chosen to save the day because it's a lot more weight than just someone who's chosen to save the day. It's an actual type of entity. Chosen, the chosen one has to have been conceived in that same way for him to be the chosen one. It's not a title you can just sort of throw around willy-nilly. Little recap there, right, so Anakin is created in the same way as the Valley of the Jedi. It's the entire force, light and dark, clash, clash together to create balance, and Anakin is that balance. That balance is the force within Anakin, and that's the balance, that's the power inside that the father wants Anakin to tap into, to bring out to um, tame the ones, and that's the point of Anakin, he can bring that chosen one power from within himself, and um, fulfil the prophecy. So it's the same, it's the same power within Anakin that flows around on Mortis. And the reason Anakin was defying the father is because he chose to pull it from around him instead of pulling it from within. George Lucas actually goes a lot further into the Chosen One concept in Willow, of all things. Where he has Anakin Skywalker and Alora Dan, and there's basically two identical parallels. The, the same Chosen One character, both born of dark and light, both Chosen One characters who are meant to bring balance. And we get a look at this in George Lucas's Shadow Wars trilogy, which is the sequel of books um, to the Willow movie, which is basically set in the same universe as Star Wars. You know, the Force exists in Willow. Um, it's called the Great Mystery in both Revenge of the Sith and in Willow. Um, you know, it's the same thing. It's the Force. It's the binding energy. It's, it's in both of the franchises. Magic is the bloodstream of the universe. And Laura Dannon and Anakin Skywalker's character um, they mirror each other almost identically, and the diagrams for the Force in both of them, in both Willow and Star Wars, look almost identical, and there's certain connections and parallels that we can draw between them, which we're going to do now. And as you can see here, um, Laura Dannon is in the centre, um, the same as the Father, where they say the Mortis are. We are the middle, the beginning, and the end. Okay, and we are beginning, the middle, and the end. The Father is the middle. Of course, the Father is functionally the same as Anakin. I'll connect that to the Jedi symbol for the Force, which contains them same four key compartments. Of course, three triangles or circles um, around the outside and then one in the middle. This symbol for the Force is almost identical to Plagueis' writings, um, in, which is pretty it. much identical to the Holy Trinity in Christianity. The Father is not the Spirit, is not the Son, is not the Father, but all is God. But the Holy Trinity actually only has one circle in the middle for God. Both Willow and Star Wars' diagrams both have two circles in the middle, and it's actually left empty in Plagueis' writings, um, but we do see what it is in the middle in Willow, which of course is Laura Dannon, and who do we know who's a parallel of Laura Dannon? Who do we know who's the embodiment of the Force, who's the same as the Father who's in the middle? And then who do we know who would be the living result of Plagueis' experiments? Who's Plagueis trying to create there? You know what I mean? He's obviously aiming for that. That's left blank for a reason, and Anakin fits in there. Plagueis does indeed say that midichlorians can even conceive a new life form and bestow upon it powers greater than any Jedi's ever dreamt generating convergence in the Force, causing a vessel of pure energy, which is on the same page as this diagram, um, as well as what we've got in Star Wars and Vehicles collection as well. So I'd say that's pretty certain that Anakin goes in that center, um, in that center circle there. And of course, if we fill in the graphs with what we know, um, we get something like this. Is not Anima, is not Aperion, is not Numa. All is the Force and all is Anakin. Which really links back to what I was going on about, about the all the energy in the galaxy flowing through Anakin and Mortis at the same time. You know, what's going on within Anakin is also going on without Anakin. It's going on outside of them. It's going on in Mortis. So Mortis is essentially an abstraction of um, Anakin's internal struggle. You can see the ones as manifestations of... Anakin's subconscious, um, sort of like angels on the shoulder sort of thing. Which is why you get stuff like um, in the episode gallery where, and in the episode itself, where Anakin sees a likeness of himself in the sun. It's true what they say. You are the chosen one. Join me. Together we can change the balance of the universe. So it all just links back to the sun being an integral part of Anakin himself. You know, he exists within him. Mortis exists within You know, Anakin is the force. The force is Anakin. That's what the chosen one is. And this is the sort of shit that um, like Dave Filoni and stuff are like reluctant to talk about. These are like the little tiny bits that they want you to pick apart in the episode. Um, 
These are the kind of things that he says to look out for to sort of piece, up, to piece together. You will notice on this box that there is no lengthy documentary on the Mortis trilogy. Christian Taylor, who wrote the trilogy and myself, we both firmly believe that we should really not answer directly a lot of the questions about Mortis. I actually think the hint at this really strongly at the very end of the episode, um, when the father dies and he tells Anakin to beware your heart. Now what's important there is the heart is where the vital gate is basically. That's where the vital gate is where you release your spirit. So if you're releasing any power from within yourself, you're releasing it through your vital gate. And the heart is where the inner self is contained, right? They talk about it in Revenge of the Sith with the whole fairness heart metaphor. Him and Anakin's trying to release his fairness heart, but he's got all these firewalls of Jedi training built up around his heart, um, so he can't release his spirit, and it's that sort of thing um, that's being hinted at here. He saw lightsabers crossed at the Count's throat. Clouds lifted from his heart. Clouds of Jabim, of Argonar, of Kamino, of even the Tuscan camp. For the first time in too many years, he felt young, as young as he really was. Young and free and full of light. But Palpatine's words, rage is your weapon, have given Anakin permission to unseal the shielding around his furnace heart, and all his fears and all his doubts shrivel in its flame. There was a thermonuclear furnace where his heart should be, and it was burning through the firewalls of his Jedi training. He held the force in the clench of a white-hot fist. He was half-Sith already, and he didn't even know it. So you've got the whole thing with Anakin's furnace heart. Then you've got the father saying that on Mortis. But beware your heart. Which then leads back to the whole... As the balance in this world crumbles, so shall war escalate in your galaxy. Which is all because... The planet is the force. It's that link there between Mortis and the galaxy because it's the same energies that run through Mortis that run through the galaxy. So it affects both. You and the Nabu form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. Any conflict here could have dramatic repercussions for the universe at large. And where else do we see that same link? So we get as his own internal balance was affected so the galaxy fell to the dark side. And we also get as the balance in this world crumbles so shall war escalate in your galaxy. And of course, war, dark side, same thing. So it means the same thing. And both Mortis and Anakin get this exact same accolade. So while I do say that Anakin is functionally the same as the father, it's technically more correct to say that he is functionally the same as Mortis as a whole, because he's the conduit for the power, and he's all three of the ones, essentially. That's the whole big metaphor within Mortis, right, is that Mortis is Anakin's heart. It ties in with the whole um, heart metaphor in Revenge of the Sith, and um, once you start to see these things, you really do start to see Star Wars on a deeper level. Um, a lot of things have a lot more meaning and um, a lot more complexity to them. So Anakin is essentially the beating heart at the centre of the universe. He's the circle in the middle, the embodiment of the Force. Does this have something to do with the prophecy you spoke of? Everything. Qui-Gon believes that the boy, Anakin is his name, stands at the centre of a virgence in the Force. But Dooku's news about a human boy at the center of a virgins of the Force had come as a shock. And where else do we see this circle in the middle? Well, we see it four element theory, um, which is what this whole thing seems to be based off of. Um, Aristotle, in particular, um, has a theory of Aether, which was the fifth element which goes in the middle, which is the binding balance to everything, essentially. Which, of course, is the exact same thing Lucas was going for with Anakin and the Lord Dan. Someone in the direct center to balance the anima, Aperion, and Numa. So you're probably wondering what are Numa, Anima, and Aperion. Basically, they're the three different aspects of the Force that Plagueis talks about in Book of Sith in his writings. I'm not going to go too deep into this because I will do another video dedicated entirely to it. But essentially what you've got is a mind, body, and soul situation like seen in the Holy Trinity. And so you've got Numa, which is essentially mind. Um, that's your individual part of... Um, th that's the individual part of the Force. That's you. That's the self. That's willpower um, and stuff like that that belongs to you, the individual part of the Force. Then you've got Anima, um, midichlorians induce and sustain it, so that is living force. Then you've got Hyperion, which is the cosmic force. So it's all about balancing them three aspects of the force, and when you balance all them three, then you've got perfect balance at that point. And of course, there's no second circle in the Holy Trinity. Or in Aether, the second in a circle would just be the embodiment of the first in a circle. And of course, that scene with Laura and Anakin. The very inner circle defines the outer inner circle. 
back to Aether, which is the fifth element in the middle, which um, Allura and Anakin seem to represent. Um, Aether had large, largely to do with the celestial bodies and the planets and that larger sort of symbiotic circle. And medieval concepts actually show this. The innermost spheres are the terrestrial spheres, while the outer are made of Aether and contain the celestial bodies, um, which of course reminds me of the Mortis um, sort of yin and yang. Um, symbol that they stand on, um, and of course the outer layers. Um, that's what Anakin. That is the celestial bodies, which is what Anakin starts. You know, he stands in the center and he spins the celestial bodies around himself um, when he tames the ones, and that's almost like the destiny aligning there. So basically, there's a lot more weight than is given credit that lies within Anakin's conception. Um, the chosen one has a lot more weight behind it. It's not just a little title that you can throw around. Um, there's a lot of mechanics behind all of this. And I feel like, largely, it's only really been explored on the very surface level. Which is quite funny, right? Because Star Wars is like the biggest franchise like ever, um, and no one's ever been talking about this type of stuff. I have made a blog on um, Anakin Skywalker, The Power of Anakin Skywalker. Um, you can go read that, leave a link in the description, but basically this video is just a section of that blog. Um, turn this into a video for YouTube, and I'm going to do that with a lot of my blogs. Um, next video I'm going to do is going to be about um, how Anakin unleashes this power. Um, we talked about in this video how the father wants him to unleash it. Um, next video we're going to talk about when he does that and how he actually um, does it. And in the future, um, I'm going to start doing videos on like um, the mechanics of the Force and some maybe some versus matchups and um, the power of certain characters and stuff like that. So um, yeah, if you're interested, stick around. If you're not, then don't.